All right, welcome to lecture four of our IEP class on causality. This lecture will start our first out of three lectures on causal structure learning. And just a note for those following along online, unfortunately, I'm giving today's lecture in front of an empty lecture hall. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with the uh, in-person recordings for lectures three and four, uh, but hopefully those are resolved now and we can get back on track for lectures five through eight. So in the first uh, section on policy evaluation, we talked about a lot of questions that you can answer if you are assuming that you know the causal graph of the variables that you're looking at, of the system uh, you're trying to describe. And if you ask somebody, you know, okay, how do you know one of those causal graphs? They'll say something like, well, that comes from a combination of common sense and domain expertise. In terms of common sense, you know, there are some things anybody can say, well, if you give somebody a treatment and then a few months later you observe their outcome, well, it's clear that the treatment could affect the outcome, but the outcome is not going to be affecting the treatment. In terms of domain expertise, you know, things like just timing information might not be enough. You might actually have to dig down into the details and say, okay, in our uh, instrumental variables example from lecture three, when we were talking about whether there could be an effect of a tobacco tax on uh, cancer directly and not just the one uh, through smoking, whether or not the tobacco tax increases or decreases people's amount of smoking, then you have to start thinking about things like oh, well, is there anything else that I could think of that would be affecting it? You know, can the tobacco tax cause increased stress and that leads to cancer? Um, and, you know, you're going to be making an assumption by ruling that out and some of those are like very field specific. You really need some expertise with the systems that you're dealing with to know whether or not those assumptions are good. But what happens if you don't have that expertise or nobody has that expertise? There's just not a domain expert to talk to. And the system I like thinking about is a gene regulatory network. Humans have roughly 20,000 genes. And it's pretty unreasonable to think that you're going to go sit down with a biology expert and ask them, okay, does gene A cause gene B? Does gene A cause gene C? So on and so forth for every pair of 20,000 genes. Um, so what we would like to be able to do is uh, learn gene regulatory networks from data. Um, and one of the really great things that we have uh, in the context of gene regulatory networks is uh, ability to generate interventional data. So let's talk about uh, just a example for anybody who's interested, um, make things a little bit concrete. Uh, so this will actually be an E. coli, not in humans, uh, but the idea is the same. So they have this system where there is a tryptophan repressor gene that encodes for a protein, again, just a tryptophan repressor protein. And what this protein does is it potentially locks on to some tryptophan that's floating around in the environment. Those go and kind of activate this protein and then what it's able to do is go and bind to this region of DNA uh, that is right next to all of the genes that encode for tryptophan. Uh, in E. coli, I believe it's five. Uh, so what it does is it comes in here and it kind of blocks uh, the cellular machinery from going in and uh, transcribing these genes. So if we were to think about forming an intervention on this system, we have the ability, say, to form knockouts and uh, set, basically, the expression level of this gene to zero, say, by completely removing that segment of DNA. And then what we would see is, uh, you know, this protein's not going to exist in the cell anymore, and therefore, 
these are never going to be able to have their uh, transcription blocked in the same way. So we'll see an increase in their level of transcription. And another wonderful thing about biotechnology is that we can actually get single cell measurements of all of these genes. And we can do something like potentially with these 20,000 genes, get something like a million single cell samples. I'm trying to learn the network from that plus uh, data potentially about interventions on each of the cells. Okay, so I'm going to give an overview of some of the approaches to causal structure learning. Uh, note that this would also be called causal discovery by some. Um, so uh, we'll divide it into three parts kind of at the first level. So here we just have approaches to causal structure learning. And the main division people usually make is between constraint-based methods So these are methods that, you know, we have a causal model is uh, in the last two lectures we were thinking about, okay, this causal model implies some conditional independence constraints on the data. The idea of these algorithms is to take those implied constraints, look at the data, see uh, what constraints uh, we might be able to uh, pin down and say, oh, A is conditionally independent of B given uh, S in the data. And uh, you know, use some assumptions to transport those uh, conditional independent statements in the data back to separation statements in the graph. So those place some constraints on what edges can and cannot be there in the graph. That's why these are called constraint-based methods. The other uh, kind of high-level philosophy behind method design is score-based methods. So these are methods that assign to each of the possible causal models of the system a different score. Um, a higher score is supposed to denote that this uh, model fits the data better. Uh, typically these are like penalized maximum likelihood scores. So the maximum likelihood part uh, prioritizes that the graph actually fits the data. Um, and the penalization uh, makes it so that smaller graphs are preferred. If you have a big graph and a small graph that fit the data equally well, so a graph with fewer edges, uh, then you're gonna prefer that graph with fewer edges over the big graph with more edges. Um, in between the score-based and the constraint-based methods, uh, people will also say, okay, there are some hybrid methods. Um, these hybrid methods are supposed to be combining aspects of the constraint-based methods and the score-based methods. So what they might do is uh, come up with some uh, constraints that can narrow the search space of these score-based methods, and then uh, use a score-based method within this smaller search space. And as I'm alluding to, these score-based methods, uh, kind of one of the more difficult things uh, that you have to think about, you know, just defining a score, uh, penalize maximum likelihood, something like that is usually going to work well. But then how am I going to optimize this score? I have all of these graphs, I don't want to just enumerate them. I want to do something smart and explore the space of graphs in a way that will lead me to the highest scoring one, you know, in an efficient manner. So the kind of next level of division that I would put is between the ways that these score-based methods approach uh, that problem. So first, we have exact methods. So these perform some sort of exact search over the space, uh, often using techniques from combinatorial optimization, integer linear programming. And you know, they don't have to usually exhaustively enumerate everything. They can use some branch and bound techniques to get rid of uh, some large portions of the solution space. But what they do is that they ensure that they actually return exactly the graph that maximizes 
uh, the score that you've set out to maximize. On the other hand, we have uh, greedy methods, which um, perform a greedy search over that search space. So basically, they say, uh, let's initialize at a either randomly chosen graph or a graph uh, that we think has a good score based on some heuristic method. And then we're starting there. And these methods define a kind of neighborhood of other graphs that you can move to, uh, maybe by adding or deleting or flipping edges. And then you look at all of those neighbors, see how the score changes, and you go to the one where the score increases the most. And you keep repeating this step until you get stuck. Uh, so you get to a graph where all of the neighbors um, have worse score. That would be a local maximum. Um, and generally you would think, okay, well, that sounds nice, but what happens if we get kind of stuck somewhere that we shouldn't be? So we get stuck at a local maximum that's not equal to the global maximum. It's not truly the thing that exactly maximizes the score. Uh, one nice thing about greedy methods, and this relies on some nice kind of combinatorial properties of uh, these causal DAG models, is that uh, you can show that they're actually consistent in the sense of uh, in the limit of infinite data. If I'm uh, using uh, these scores and I'm using a greedy method, actually there's not going to be any local maxima that aren't the global maxima, basically. So I can kind of without loss of generality, just take these greedy steps. Now, that isn't going to necessarily hold at finite samples, uh, which is why if you want like the best of the best kind of statistical performance, you might prefer the exact search methods. These greedy methods can perform pretty well in practice. On the kind of final uh, end of the spectrum from kind of most computationally expensive, but most uh, you know, statistically favorable in terms of maximizing the score uh, to least, we would have gradient-based methods. Um, so this is a kind of newer class of methods that relax our combinatorial optimization problem over graphs into a continuous optimization problem so that we can then run gradient descent. So these do things like OK, I am going to, instead of thinking about uh, you know, the adjacency matrix of graph, just the matrix of 0 and 1s, now I'm going to have the matrix of, say, all the edge weights of the graph. And then I can put some uh, penalties on that, uh, or even constraints, to ensure that the graph is acyclic. Uh, that is one of the big things that has enabled these gradient-based methods to start uh, becoming more popular. Um, but as of now, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's not going to be a guarantee that uh, just gradient descent is going to find uh, the uh, exact optimum. Um, so you might get worried about uh, getting stuck in a local minimum here and even maybe in the limit of infinite data. Um, right, so in this lecture, uh, we're going to kind of think about what causal models we can identify from our data. So I'll start off by a kind of negative example that says, well, maybe we can't identify a causal model uh, because there's two or more that actually describe my data equally well. So we'll consider two causal models, MA and MB where in MA we have x1 is going to x2, and in MB we have x2 is going to x1. And in MA, you might think okay, x1 is equal to some epsilon 1, where epsilon 1 is, say, normal 0, 1, and x2 is equal to a times x1 plus some epsilon 2. Say so again, epsilon 2 is normal 0, 1. 
and an MB. X2 comes first. So X2 is equal to some epsilon 2. And then if we want these to be the same model, well, what variance does this need to have? Uh, it's pretty clear from this that the expected value of both x1 and x2 are both 0. Um, and this is also just going to be a linear combination here. Um, so we're going to have something times x2 plus epsilon 1. So the first moments are taken care of. Well, the covariance in this model is going to be uh, x1 is just going to have a variance of 1. The covariance of x1 and x2 is just going to be a here. And then uh, the, covari the variance of x2, uh, there will be a squared from this term plus 1 from that term. So if we want uh, x2 to have the same variance in this model, we need this variance here to be a squared plus 1. And then if we want uh, x1 and x2 to have the same covariance, we need to do this coefficient as a over a squared plus 1. All right, and then the final piece to take care of is what is going to be the uh, variance for this epsilon 1 term. Uh, so we need uh, basically the variance of x1 if we want to solve for it going to be uh, this term squared times the variance of uh, x2. So one of these is just going to cancel out. Um, and plus the variance of this epsilon 1. So what do we need for that to be equal to uh, 1, which is what it was here, uh, just over a squared plus 1. So 1 over a squared plus 1. Then these two causal models, MA and MB, induce exactly the same um, covariance matrix and the same means for x1 and x2. Since it's normal distribution uh, over x1 and x2, it's described completely in terms of just the first two moments. So then we know that uh, the probability distributions entailed by these two are identical. Um, Something that you're going to do in the P set is you're going to look at data simulated from a model where, say, these are replaced by uh, uniform random variables. And uh, then you're actually going to be able to uh, do linear regression here uh, and kind of figure out, OK, what does this epsilon 2 look like? Plot it against x1 and see, OK, in the correct causal direction, say my model is generated from this data, then uh, the kind of independence assumption on my uh, noise variables holds. If I were to try to regress it this way, so I regress x1 and x2, then I'm going to get that that distribution of epsilon 1 actually depends on x2. So people have used this in kind of extensions of this observation to go beyond the kind of identifiability guarantees that I'm talking here today and actually argue that in some cases you can pin down a causal model strictly from observational data. And you know, in terms of our structural causal models, the components that we talked about it uh, were uh, our structural causal models uh, are kind of defined in terms of the causal mechanisms, so the functions that assign what bear values our endogenous variables take on, as long as our exogenous noise distributions. And these approaches are going to have to make an assumption on at least one or the other, if not both, of the uh, causal mechanisms and uh, the distributions of the exogenous variables so that you can uh, kind of go beyond the identifiability guarantees that we're talking about here. Um, so if you have no assumptions, um, or even if you just consider this Gaussian case, uh, linear Gaussian case, then uh, the kind of uh, 
identification results on which causal models can be distinguished um, are going to uh, are going to apply. Right. So. A point to note with this example is, you know, thinking back to this uh, example with the, the tryptophan repressor and maybe the ability to use interventions to uh, increase our identifiability, is that we would be able to distinguish these models if we had interventional data. So say that we're intervening on X1, well in MA, say that we, you know, do a do intervention and set this value equal to zero, then we're also going to see a change in the variance of x2. In particular, the variance will just go down to one instead of a squared plus one. Whereas in this model, uh, since x1, you know, if we set this equal to zero, that's going to have no effect on the variance of x2. So that's going to be a way to distinguish between these two models uh, that doesn't require these functional form assumptions. Um, is to instead uh, separately use interventional data. Um, so which of those is going to apply to your situation uh, you know, matters from application to application. And maybe you could use even a mixture of those to try to better identify your causal graph and be more sure about the causal structures that you learned. OK. So that takes us through a high level view of some of the types of algorithms that uh, we might be considering as well as the type of identifiability guarantees. Uh, before we dive too much into the details of the identifiability guarantees, which is going to be the main subject of today's lecture, um, I'm going to motivate it a little bit by showing how we might go about identifying a causal model. And this is going to generalize into a constraint-based algorithm called the Peter Clark algorithm, or PC algorithm, um, that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. So let's go back to one of our favorite causal models. This was the one that we've been using to think about our experiment on Mickey and Minnie. And uh, let's assume that you know, we're generating our data according to some P of X, which factorizes according to this graph. So in the limit of infinite data, you can also think about what we're going to do with finite data. Uh, this will have to be framed as conditional independence testing instead of just reading the conditional independences off the distribution like we're going to do here. Um, in infinite data, we're going to be able to you know, look at some conditional independences that hold in this distribution. And in particular, because we are saying that it factorizes according to G, recall from the last lecture that we proved that this actually says that it's Markov with respect to G. So we can look to the graph for D separation statements and know that those are also conditional independent statements in our distribution P of X. So what do we have? Well, we have, uh, say, X1 is independent of X5 down here, uh, given X4. So uh, conditioning on x4 is going to block the two paths uh, that we have here. So x1 is independent in p of x of x5 given x4. Similarly, x2 and x3 are going to be independent of x5 given x4. What else can we see? Well, x2 is independent of x3, 
if we condition just on x1, right? So x2, x3, x1. Um, and finally, are we missing anything? Uh, well, yes, so x1 is independent of x4 given uh, x2 and x3. Okay. So, here is a bit of sleight of hand that we're going to actually need to formalize in terms of assumption. But for now, let's say that um, if the graph, if uh, the conditional independence statement, say xi is independent of xj given s, holds in the distribution, let's assume, uh, this will later be something that we're calling faithfulness, that these actually imply, imply that those conditional independent statements come from the DAG. So they're not there because we chose some P of X, which has even more conditional independent statements than uh, the ones implied by the DAG. But uh, because really, you know, we got this conditional independent statement from the uh, data generating graph, right, which we don't. Uh, so let's assume for now, that we can do this? Well, this is going to tell us some things about our graph. In particular, if x1 is independent of x5, given some set, then that means x1 and x5 could not be adjacent to one another. Um, if they were adjacent to one another, like we have x1 and x2 adjacent to each other here, then there's always this trivial deconnecting path between them. Um, so there's kind of nothing that I can do to separate those nodes. So this is going to let us uh, get rid of edges um, x1 to x5, along with uh, a total of five edges here. So if we're thinking about starting with a complete graph where we had all of the edges present, uh, so usually with the complete graph, I would have an edge from x1 to x2, x3, x4, and x5. Well, this is going to license me to, say, remove the edge from x1 to x5, as well as the edge here from x4 to x5. So really, I only need or x1 to x4. Right. Um, so here, I really only need the edges from x1 to x2 and x3, then uh, for x2, uh, I don't need an edge to x3, that's this one, um, but I do need an edge to x4, and I don't need an edge to x5. For x3, uh, I've already said I don't need an edge to x2, I uh, do need an edge to x4, and then I don't need an edge to x5. And finally, with x4, we've checked all of these, uh, and if we don't have anything, uh, to say that we can remove this edge, so we'll keep that edge from x4 to x5. And what you see here is that uh, we have been able to identify what we will call the skeleton of the graph. So this is basically uh, the version of the graph with undirected edges, where we don't add any edges. So this is a different notion than the moral graph. Uh, recall in the moral graph uh, from the last two lectures, we needed to add edges uh, between any uh, two nodes that were involved in a um, structure like this. Uh, so, uh, you know, recall that th these are going to be uh, different concepts. But a skeleton, uh, very simply put, is we're given a DAG G, the skeleton. G, which we'll denote just skel of G, is the undirected graph with xi to xj, if and only if 
xi goes to xj, or I guess if, if xi goes to j, uh, say if and only if xi goes to xj or xj goes to xi and g. So we don't care what direction the arrow heads are in, uh, as long as we have uh, an adjacency here, then we have it in the skeleton. So additionally, uh, beyond the skeleton, we can identify some other things about this graph. Um, these are a little bit more subtle when you're not familiar with them. Um, but it basically comes from looking at not just the fact of I can separate two variables, but also what was it that separated them. So if we're looking, we say, OK, uh, the example I want to use here is that x2 and x3, when we separated them, you know, look over here. Uh, when we separated them, we included one of their common neighbors in this graph, but not the other. Uh, so what's up with that? Well, if we uh, needed x4 to separate x2 and x3, uh, so if this conditional independent statement instead included x4 over here, that would be telling us that uh, this path uh, x4 is a non-collider on this path. But, get, but we didn't need x4. So in some sense, that's telling us, if we look at here, uh, you know, what could possibly be consistent with the fact that we didn't need x4. Well, it has to be a collider in that case. So we're actually going to get uh, the edge from x2 to x4 and the edge from x3 to x4. Another edge that we can get is uh, the edge from x4 to x5. And this is going to be through some similar reasoning. So now that we've gotten these two edges, uh, what would make sense for the edge between x4 and x5? This one is even easier to see. Um, if we had the edge from x4 to x5 being x5 goes into x4, uh, so if we had it that way, then this would imply x5 is just independent of x2 and independent of x3. Um, and then if we did, you know, condition on x4, then we would get this uh, deconnecting path. So in particular, things like this wouldn't hold. So it can't be that way. It has to be this way. And we'll show that... Uh, these are all kind of special instances of what gets identified in the PC algorithm. And we'll show that these two edges you actually can't identify. So it could be that x1, as it does in our graph over there, goes into x2 and x3. Or it could be x2 goes to x1, goes to x3, or x3 goes to x1 to x2. Uh, we just can't figure out which directions are the right ones. Um, and what we did with orienting the edge between x2 to x4 and x3 to x4 is uh, a special instance of what are called unshielded colliders in the graph, which is another object that we can identify. So given the DAG DG, a path where we have i goes to xk, goes back up to xj, is called an unshielded lighter. Right, this already looks like a collider, so we already knew what that was. Um, an unshielded collider is saying that uh, there is no edge, so if xi is not adjacent to xj. There is no edge between xi and xj. And here, um, I'm just using the notation where adjacency, say, is uh, the union of the nodes. So 
unshielded means you know what we would consider a shield is if x i went to x j uh, had an edge there. Uh, unshielded means there's no edge. Okay. So a question that came up uh, when there were people in person, um, which segues quite nicely into the next section, is uh, are these conditional independences that we're trying to use uh, to infer the graph, are those the only things the graph implies about the probability distribution? And in the case of DAGs, where we're not making assumptions on the functional form, the answer is yes. And that's precisely what those uh, approaches to identifiability that use functional form assumptions um, are kind of exploiting is that we uh, can get kind of additional implications on our probability distribution P of X if we assume some things about the causal mechanisms and the exogenous noise variables. Um, but if we don't assume those, then the next result is going to be saying that yes, actually, the kind of conditional independences are fully characterizing um, our uh, space of probability distributions that can arise uh, by factorizing according to a graph. Um, so in particular, what we're going to be doing is proving the converse of this statement. So um, let me uh, Let me write out what we're going to want to prove. Now, um, we'll need a few uh, ingredients to get there, uh, but this direction of the proof uh, is going to be much easier than the direction that we've already proved, which is that factorization implies Markovianity. So the theorem that we're aiming to prove following, we have a DAG G, and we have a distribution that is uh, Markov with respect to that DAG. So we wrote it this way, all the D separations in the DAG, and the DAG apply uh, conditional independences in the probability distribution. Um, so suppose this holds. Then P of X factorizes according to G. Great. So once we have the ingredients, this proof won't take us too long. So the first ingredient is actually to narrow down the types of uh, deseparation statements that we're looking at. Um, and the ones that are going to be particularly helpful for us uh, tell us about how a node is related to other nodes uh, if we are conditioning on its parents. Or in the case of the graphs, uh, how, um, how it might be deseparated from other nodes by its parents. So this is going to be a lemma. Again, we're going to let G be a DAG, and we're going to let the, this ND of G denote the non-descendants. of xi. So literally just how it sounds, um, this is all of the nodes which are not its descendants. So I take out, um, we're going to use this uh, inclusive descendant. So uh, a node isn't included, it's a set of uh, non-descendants. Set minus. Make it look a little better. Um, okay, so the particular 
statement that we're going to have is that xi is deseparated in the graph from all of its non-descendants, which aren't its parents, by its parents. So basically, this is saying, well, yeah, xi, I can always get to its descendants, uh, you know, just by following those paths down. Um, and, you know, those aren't going to be blocked by the parents. But everything else, anything that's not a descendant, any of the ancestors of uh, xi that are not its parents, or anything where it's, you know, like kind of a cousin or something like that in this graph, um, those uh, we're going to be blocked from by our parents. So, uh, we're going to consider two cases. So, let's consider a path from uh, xi to xj. Well, that path, we can either have um, the first edge in the path being into xi. So uh, let's say it's xi, and then there's some node xk on this path, and it keeps going. Um, well, this is just immediately already going to be blocked at xk, because xk is a pair. Um, and this is a non collided on that path since there's no arrowhead here. So this case is easy. So let's say that the path starts the other way. Well then, if xj is a uh, non-descendant, then this path can't just you know, keep going all directed that way. There has to be some first collider on that path. It doesn't have to be xk. It can be something further down. Just to save space, let's put it there. Um, but basically, the idea is that um, if we do take whatever the first collider is on that path, so the path could have multiple colliders, it's easiest to just consider the first collider. So the first collider is xk. Uh, well, xk is a descendant of xi by virtue of being the first collider on the path. So all the edges have been directed this way so far. Right? But then that means that xk uh, can't be, or any of its descendants actually, can't be uh, in this conditioning set, parents of g. Otherwise, there would be a cycle, because we would have xi goes to xk, or whichever is descendants, so there would be a path there. But then if we said, oh, actually that node's a parent of xi, then we would have an uh, edge from that to xi, and we'd get this cycle. Um, so in both of these cases, the path has to be blocked, therefore proving um, all of the possible deconnecting paths that we considered aren't actually deconnecting. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore, our deseparation statement holds. Okay, and then the second ingredient that we're going to need um, not even a, a technical ingredient, just a definition. Uh, that will come up from time to time with DAG models is that of a topological order. So the idea is that uh, you know a DAG isn't necessarily going to define a total order on the variables. So if I have a DAG like x1, x2, both going to x3, well, uh, we do know that like x1 um, if we're trying to consider an order on the variables where uh, ancestors come before their descendants, uh, x1 comes before x3 and x2 becomes before x3. But uh, there's not necessarily a relationship between x1 or x2. So this would be a partial order. A topological order of a graph uh, just kind of chooses one uh, total order out of you know, all of the ones that are consistent with that partial order. So we say, a permutation or a total order is a top.
topological order of a DAG. G if uh, some node J being in the ancestors of I, uh, I guess we're using XJ and XI, um, if XJ in the ancestors of XI um, in the graph implies that uh, in the order XJ comes before XI. Yeah, simple as that. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use the topological order uh, to start factorizing our di distribution. So any distribution, uh, if we just specify an order that we want to factorize it, um, we'll always factorize according to a chain rule. So uh, if we pick uh, First thing in the order won't be conditioned on anything, and then everything in the order will be conditioned by all the things that come before it. We'll denote the things that come before it by pre. Um, so pre sigma of xi. Um, that just defined as all of the xj's such that in our order xj is less than xi. So this will depend on the order that we chose. You know, the DAG that we talked about here, uh, I could choose either the order x1, x2, x3, or the order x2, x1, x3. Um, in this case, pre sigma would of x2 would be 1, x1, and in this case, it would be the empty set. Right, so we're just applying uh, chain rule of probability with the uh, topological order of the DAG. What that's going to let us do is guarantee that the parents are always um, before the DAG in the topological order, and then uh, everything else that comes before it that's not apparent has to be a non descendant. Therefore, we can use uh, lemma one in order to say that we can actually get rid of everything else in this condition except besides parents. And that proves our claim. Okay. And that's essentially where the idea that we're just going to look at the conditional independent statements of the distribution uh, comes from, because this Markovianity is implying factorization. And uh, once we're thinking about factorization, well, if there's no limit on what these uh, probability, conditional probability distributions can be, um, then as long as some distribution factorizes according to two different graphs, uh, either of those graphs could be equally good for describing the data. OK, so now that the boards are magically erased, I am going to move on to talking about when two graphs have the same deseparation statements. Um, we're going to start off with a word for this. So uh, this is an important term that you'll see a lot in the causal structure learning literature. So two DAGs, G and G prime, are called Markov equivalent uh, 
if they have the same D separation statements. Uh, further, we're going to denote that equivalence using this equivalent symbol, sub m. Um, and given a graph, we can think about the set of all graphs which are Markov equivalent to it. Um, and we're going to call that uh, the Markov equivalence class. This is what we're going to try to characterize. And to preview our result, there's two terms that I mentioned before, the skeleton and the unshielded colliders, uh, will turn out to kind of fully characterize this notion of Markov equivalence in graphical terms. So the theorem that we want to prove is going to be of the form G Markov equivalent to G prime if and only if uh, they have the same skeleton and the same unshielded colliders. Necessary and sufficient condition. Uh, we're first going to work towards proving uh, the condition that Markov equivalents uh, will imply if they have the same skeleton and the same colliders, so the kind of necessary condition. Um, that they need to have the same skeleton is pretty easy from the uh, argument that we made in terms of adjacency uh, earlier. So uh, what we said was that if a graph um, has two nodes adjacent, then they can never be de-separated de by any set. Um, so now we want to show if they're not adjacent, that they actually can be. And that will tell us, okay, you know, Markov equivalent graphs at least need to have the same skeleton. Um, and this is something that we'll actually return to, simple as it is. Uh, but this is just a corollary of the lemma that we proved, actually. So if xi and xj are non-adjacent, Descendant of xj or xj is a non descendant of xi. Um, otherwise, you know, if they're both descendants of each other, we would have a cycle. Okay, so this gives us non adjacency, implies that there is some separating set. And then that further gives us, okay, uh, the two decks have to have the same skeleton if they're going to be Markov um, equivalent. So, slightly more tough is that. Uh, they must have the same unshielded colliders. 
Um, so uh, this lemma two is just going to be uh, the necessary condition uh, for uh, the theorem. So uh, you know the skeletons are equal by their by this corollary. Right, so that's a necessary condition already. Therefore, now we can assume that G and G prime have the same skeleton, but different unshielded colliders. Just in case I slip up, I do want to make a note that unshielded colliders uh, have a lot of different names. So uh, one that we're already kind of familiar of with from talking about the moral graph is immoralities. Um, sometimes also V structures. This term might be a little less clear because people talk about uh, sometimes just colliders as V-structures, so when I say shielded or unshielded V-structures. Um, so I'm going to try to stick to unshielded colliders uh, in these lectures. Um, right, so now what we're going to say is, uh, okay, they have this different unshielded colliders. Let's let G be the one without loss of generality that has someone that G prime doesn't have. So uh, let's say that it's in G, but not G prime. But these graphs have the same skeleton. So this path has to be there in some form um, in G prime. So if we let S B whichever of these two sets, Xi, the parents of Xi, or the parents of Xj, such that the separation holds, so Xi is dependent or deseparated from Xj given the parents of or given just this set S one of these parent sets uh, that's guaranteed to exist, um, such an S, well, this is just immediately um, the set that's going to give us the difference in D connection. Because uh, in the graph uh, G, Xi, and Xj are deseparated uh, given that set. But Xk is not in that set. so. Whichever of these it, it is, xk is not in s. And then if we're in g prime, then this path has to be a non-collider. So in particular, this path, when we condition um, on s, is going to be open. Like we're going to have xi is deconnected in g prime to xj. Okay. Now we want to work on proving that having the same skeleton and having the same unshielded colliders is actually a sufficient condition. And what we're going to do uh, for that is basically try to find a path in our graph G. Um, so if we have a deconnecting path in G, and we can show that there's also a deconnecting path in G prime uh, under these conditions uh, that will give the result to us. Right, so uh, unfortunately, we don't want to work with just any deconnecting paths. Um, I guess those don't necessarily have nice enough properties. Uh, but what we can always try to do is take 
a deconnecting path and you know just repeatedly keep making it shorter. Um, so say that we start off with uh, some deconnecting path that goes from x1 to x4 like this, but oh, there's actually an edge here, then we would uh, replace that with the path x1 to x2 to x4, and we're going to call a path where you can't do this, so you keep repeatedly applying it until you can't do this anymore. That's going to give us um, a minimal path. So a deconnecting path, gamma, I guess this is given, some set S it is minimal. start by uh, thinking about a path that we have where gamma m minus 1 goes to gamma m goes to gamma m plus 1, and these are adjacent. Uh, well, these would have to be, uh, would have to go this way uh, for acyclicity. Um, what we wanted to do is show that if this occurs, uh, then uh, gamma cannot be a minimal deconnecting path. So we're proving part of the contrapositive. OK. So what if we just have gamma prime, where uh, we replace the segment uh, gamma m minus 1, gamma m, gamma m plus 1, basically. Uh, with gamma m minus 1 to 
to gamma and pulsar directly. Well, uh, we want to argue that this path is still going to be deconnecting, so it's pretty easy to see because uh, this node is going to be um, a non-collider in both gamma and in gamma prime. Uh, so uh, by the fact that it's a non-collider in gamma, gamma is deconnecting, that means that uh, gamma m minus 1 can't be an s. Uh, okay, when we go to gamma prime, it's still not an s, so it's still not blocked. Uh, so this is going to be like a usual argument that we're going to say, okay, if the kind of collider or non-collider status doesn't change between uh, gamma and gamma prime, then uh, whether or not the node is blocked also won't change, because we haven't changed what s is. So the only thing that like tells us whether or not something is blocked is whether or not it's collider. Um, and this is also true of gamma m plus one, right? It's just that uh, it could either be a non-collider or a collider. But either way, you know, the only thing that we did is we replaced this edge with this edge. They both have the arrows going into gamma m plus one. So um, uh, gamma m plus one's collider and non-collider status doesn't change. So this rules out um, a minimal path having a uh, subpath kind of of this form um, that's going to hold equally well just by symmetry uh, if it's gamma m plus one to gamma m minus to gamma m to gamma m minus one. So the other case uh, is going to be if we had gamma m being a collider on the path. Um, and then we kind of have symmetry here, uh, right? So let's just say without lots of generality that we have the uh, edge from gamma n minus 1 to gamma n plus 1 um, in that direction. Uh, okay. So Because gamma m is a collider, gamma m or one of its descendants has to be uh, in the conditioning set. So let's just note that down. Uh, gamma m intersection with s can't be the empty set. Uh, the descendants of gamma m intersection with the empty uh, intersection with s is not the empty set. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's take instead um, gamma prime, where we're replacing this segment with uh, just directly the edge. I guess this is exactly what we said before. We've replaced this segment with the edge gamma m minus 1 to gamma m plus 1. OK, and gamma prime, we want to show, is minimal. Um, and what's going to happen is that, uh, well, uh, gamma m plus 1 was a non-collider for sure before, because we have this edge going out. Well, now it can either stay a non-collider, so we could have the edge going out this way, or it could become a collider uh, by replacing that edge. Uh, so if it remains a non-collider, what's going to happen is that it's just going to still be unblocked. That's the argument we gave earlier. But if it changes its collider status, so if it goes from being a non-collider in this gamma path to a collider in the gamma uh, prime path, uh, what we need to check is that one of the descendants of gamma m plus 1 is conditioned on, uh, is in the set S. But because we have the edge from gamma m plus 1 to gamma m, that means actually you know, the descendants of gamma m are included in the descendants of gamma m plus 1. So uh, this uh, non-trivial intersection is also going to hold for gamma m plus 1. And it's not going to be blocked there. So that also gets rid of this option and shows that the only option is that gamma m kind of forks out to both gamma m minus 1 and gamma m plus 1. 
now we want to show that one of those is a clear one. Um, so suppose neither of them were colliders. Uh, if we had this, right? So we have gamma m going out this way. Well, nothing in this is a collider, so uh, we can't have any of like those nodes. None of gamma m minus one gamma m or gamma m plus one R and S. All right, so then we can just replace uh, whichever way this edges, we can replace it. Um, and in both cases, uh, wherever we're going to uh, be keeping the collider and non collider status of gamma m plus one, um, or gamma m minus one, if the edge is in the other direction. So uh, one of them has to be a collider. We have to have it going in, and then that would say why we can't take uh, this shortcut. Okay, and notice as a corollary of this proposition, um, basically that any of the uh, colliders in our uh, deconnecting path have to be unshielded. Uh, right, so if we have a collider, then they can't be a, the gamma m minus one and gamma m plus one can't be adjacent. AKA it's an unshielded collider. Um, and therefore, uh, since we know that uh, G and G prime have the same unshielded colliders, then if we have let a, uh, if we have a minimal path in G, uh, then that path gamma um, in G prime has the same unshielded colliders. And the setup of this corollary is suppose uh, have the same colliders. setup of this is just the, uh, the skeletons uh, and unshielded colliders are the same. Okay, so that is at least going to make uh, transporting our path from G to G prime easier. Because then we only have to consider what's happening uh, when we're transporting gamma, a minimal path from G to G prime. But we only have to consider what's happening at the non colliders. Okay, so let's finally move on to the proof of our main theorem, and that's going to wrap up the lecture today. So we want to consider a minimal deconnecting path. It's in G. Uh, we kind of want to break that into segments and show that uh, you know out of each of those segments we can build a corresponding deconnecting path in G prime. So we'll consider three types of segments. First, we're going to consider a segment where uh, gamma m is a non-collider and nodes on either side of it are not adjacent. We'll 
since it's not a collider in uh, in G by our corollary, it also has to be a non-collider in G prime. Um, and you know, then we're not changing the non-collider status of gamma m, uh, so we just use same segment in G prime, or in our path gamma prime that we're constructing in G prime. Okay, so if similarly uh, we have all of that, that it's a non-collider, uh, but uh, gamma m minus 1 and gamma m plus 1 are adjacent, then what's going to happen is that uh, you know, we have this fork structure from the proposition and that one of uh, either gamma m minus 1 or gamma m plus 1 has to be a collider, so say it's gamma m minus 1, right? Then we know uh, this is in G, then we know in G prime, since these, this minimal path has the same uh, colliders, uh, that it's also like that in G prime. Okay, well that means still gamma M is not a collider in, uh, in G prime. Right, it could be this way, it could have an edge like this or this, but at least gamma M um, on this side uh, ensures that it's not a collider. Uh, therefore, again, collider status doesn't change. Um, Non-collider remains a non-collider. Uh, we can still use the same segment. Okay, and in the final case, we have gamma M a collider. In which case, you know, it has to have some descendant uh, S that's in our conditioning set. Um, so let let's have S. Let's have this be a minimal path. Let's consider this gamma uh, to be the shortest path from, uh, or this this path lambda to be the shortest path from gamma M to S. This is path in G. What happens when we start looking at this path in G prime? Well, two things could happen. So we either, um, well, we three things I guess could happen. Um, the first one is that this path is just still directed all the way down to S, and then we're fine. You know, gamma M my M was a uh, collider on the path in G, it's also a collider in the path in G prime, and it still has this descendant uh, to make sure that the path is open there. Um, if this isn't a descendant anymore, uh, that means you know some of the edges on the path have to be reversed. Uh, so we could either have that you know this first edge is still out, and then it reverses some point later, or that this first edge even also into gamma and so these would be what's happening in G prime. Right, so um, in the case where this first edge is out, then we can pick some first non-collider in the path, the one that's closest to uh, gamma m. Uh, let's call that lambda u. Um, what we are going to want to say here 
is that uh, this actually can't happen because uh, gamma u would have to be a uh, collider also in g, not just in g prime. Um, so why is that the case? Well, we said that lambda was the shortest path. Um, and just by acyclicity in g, uh, if uh, there was you know, some um, gamma u minus 1 uh, and gamma or lambda u plus 1, um, that were connected here uh, in G, they would have to be uh, connected in um, this way, and then we would just get a shorter path to S. So this actually can't be the case. So the only option uh, with uh, how all these edges could change uh, when we're going from G to G prime, is that now this first edge is actually into gamma M in G prime. Right, so then what's going to happen is that since it's a collider, um, and in G we actually had uh, this edge going out, right, that would give us structure of this form, um, we said that they have the same, that G prime and G have the same uh, unshielded colliders, right? So that's where these edges are coming from. I'm shielding those colliders uh, to make sure that uh, we respect that. And then, so this is in G, well, for acyclicity, we have to have uh, gamma m minus 1 and gamma m plus 1 pointing to this child of, of gamma m. Um, so the first node in that path lambda. And the argument here is that, OK, sure, uh, this is going to basically give us a new path in G, uh, gamma m minus 1 down to lambda back up to gamma m plus 1. Um, so we basically replaced uh, gamma m as the collider with lambda 1 as the collider. This gives us a new path. Um, and what we're going to actually think about doing is basically repeating this argument. So this gives us a new minimal deconnecting path in G. We keep repeating this and repeating this. Uh, this is similar to the idea of uh, choosing a minimal path. We can uh, do this so that we choose a path where we can't do this anymore. And all we're doing right is taking uh, a collider and replacing it by one of its children. And we just keep doing that. That has to bottom out eventually because our graph is infinite. Um, so that would uh, that would complete our result here. Um, another option for this sort of proof is to define a minimal path as uh, one where you actually also can't do that. And then maybe it's, it's clearer to see. Um, but uh, we only use this kind of descendant property once for this very last step. So uh, I thought it would be more clear to just say that the path is minimal um, in the sense that we already said and treat this as kind of a special case. Um, so that's all. Uh, in the next lecture, uh, we'll talk about how to identify graphs up to their Markov equivalence class. Thanks.